uh, but before we start, I uh, give over for uh, a more precise introduction uh, to Professor Yin Shema. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Professor Eric Anro. Uh, and so Thomas just say a little bit different language. Maybe, maybe some little bit Chinese. Maybe. Ni hao. Ni hao, yeah. <laughs> so um, Eric and I are friends for 14 years. We met 2008 in Beijing, China. So from then we start to keep on contact and it's wonderful to, wonderful to see that this long-term friendship come into a wonderful event like, like we're doing now. So he is uh, a professor at, of theoretical physics, uh, theoretical biological physics at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He started his scientific career as a mathematical physicist. He received his PhD at the Goldberg University in Sweden in uh, 1989 and did a postdoc uh, in between 1989 to 1990 at the Observatory de Nice, France. You were at Sweden. So, I, I can send you website. Okay. So. <laughs> And he holds the chair of the theoretical biological physics at ETH since 2003. So he will talk about uh, today fluctuation relations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Yinzi. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the fantastic welcome that we have received here in Durban. It's wonderful to be here. So when preparing something to talk about, um, I, we discussed with, uh, with Jinsi some, um, yeah, I was supposed to say something, right? About, um, there was something I should explain, right? Yeah, no, no Chinese language. Uh, never mind. <laughs> so we already forgot it. So the, um, I, um, I was, I proposed some different uh, things to talk about, and Yinsi uh, chose this, which in fact is a presentation which I gave uh, by invitation to the um, to the Nobel Committee and the Swedish Academy uh, of Science before the summer. And so I thought, you know, the, this this group, uh, um, of course, uh, is uh, full of eminent scientists, but not uh, very experts in the field. So I thought this, uh, you know, you have to uh, make it simple and uh, when you talk to them. And so therefore I thought this is uh, uh, for a general audience could also be a suitable uh, topic uh, for today. So I will talk about the topic of fluctuation relations on which I worked a bit. Uh, Angelo, who is in the audience, has also worked on the topic of fluctuation relations and related topics. And the plan of the talk is the, no, it doesn't work today. Okay, worked before. Okay, let's see, can we go forward? How do we go forward? Yeah, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, there's this one, okay. Okay, we should try now. Okay, no, there you see, okay. There's always something that can happen. Huh? Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. okay. I see all of you. Okay, should we try now? No, no. So I should I should do like this, just a step manually. Head? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I can say something. So fluctuation relations, while you are fixing this, it has been a major topic in statistical physics over the last 20 years. So there was a reason I was um, supposed to talk, I was invited to talk about it. And uh, I, I thought also at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, it's not the time for a completely, should I try again? Uh, just a second. Yes, fine. Great, great. So we know what happened now. Okay, I see the beautiful audience. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful room. But uh, it's a, an advantage if I see my slides also. Just yeah. Second. Where are they? I can see Tanya. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. 
okay. Yeah, okay, this is good. Can we move forward now? As shape for the keep going soon. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not sh uh, screen saving now. Is, are you screen 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 sharing? Do the people on Zoom see what I see and what the audience sees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, share there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we will see. No, it still doesn't work. Can I? Uh, no, it does work. No, it does work. Uh, are, are we interfering? It's it's just walking forward. It's not working backward. <laughs> backward is this one. Yeah. Uh huh. No, 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 no. It, 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 this is interference. I think it doesn't really. Yeah. Can you move back to the first one where we were? Now you're moving forward. Okay. Uh -huh. So it's actually a mistake was on my part, actually. The mistake was on my part later. I didn't realize that on this, you know, you have two different buttons, one to push forward and one to push backward. So the outline of the talk, I will make, the, I will state the most famous uh, fluctuation radiation, by far the most well-known. And I will derive it using a, a little bit of mathematics uh, time reversal of the Cramer's Langevin equation, which um, for at least the physicist and the audience should be familiar. I will give a historical outline of um, most of the fluctuation relations as a wide field and talk about the place of fluctuation relations in classical statistical physics. Uh, then I realized when coming here and talking a bit to, to Thomas uh, uh, that uh, quantum dynamics is a, a major field of interest here in Durban. So to make it a bit more personal, I will, I will end by going a bit more technical on the quantum, uh, open quantum system side and uh, make an outline of a recent work that we did together with uh, Julio Kiribella and uh, Karol Dzhutskovsky, which I think though has a relation to the topic of fluctuation relations. So fluctuation relations were achieved fame by far, this is easy to say, by, uh, uh, um, Two papers published by um, by Chris Jarzinski now 25 years ago, and those papers contain the uh, let's see now this pointer doesn't work like it did before, but you can see the equation says that you have the exponential of work uh, denoted W in units of inverse temperature with KBT, so beta is the standard. Uh, notation in statistical mechanics for one over KBT times T. KB is Boltzmann's constant, T is the temperature. And um, the uh, brackets means averaging. So you have a number of processes, and I will give some examples later, which kind of processes for which you can measure the work. And I will give you a formula for the work. And then you do an, a, a, an empirical average, you, a sample average of the measured exponential of minus the work. And this turns out to be exponential of minus the free energy difference in the state, the initial state and the final state. And uh, what you can see highlighted there is a, uh, is a blown up of a, um, a statement in the paper, which I will read to you. The free energy landscape between two equilibrium states is well related to the irreversible work, and that's the terminology used in this, uh, in this paper, required to drive the system from one state to another. So you have an exact relation, which is unusual and unexpected in far from equilibrium thermodynamics. And it's, an ex it's a relation between exponentials. And it's on one side, on the left-hand side, it's an average over non-equilibrium quantities. And on the other side, it's an exponential of a of difference between two ex exponential one, uh, um, equilibrium quantities. So uh, uh, I will discuss this in, okay. yes. The average is the, uh, sorry, now I forgot this. The average is the sample average. You do the same process with the same initial conditions and you do it many times. You, uh, that means that you pick the initial conditions of the process uh, with respect to uh, the initial uh, distribution. 
in Jarzinski's uh, equality, that will be the um, Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution, the equilibrium distribution. And then you run the non-equilibrium protocol with the, using the same deterministic change of the, uh, of the control parameter. And so you do it uh, in the examples, which I will come to later, maybe you do it a thousand times, you get a thousand values of the work, and then you take the sum of E to the minus these, uh, each of these values, and you divide by a thousand. And this is the, uh, this is the average. Okay. Okay, so I'm talking about, I will discuss fluctuation relations in the context, context of time reversal. And to remind you, um, I, I have a reminder slide here of classical deterministic time reversal. Uh, I imagine that there is a control parameter here written lambda. It starts at the initial time, which is time zero at a some value lambda i, lambda initial, and it ends at the final time of the process, tf in this slide. Um, at another value, or maybe the same value, but then let's say for this case, the another value, lambda final. Then we know that in um, conservative systems, the uh, Hamilton's equations of motion is uh, reads that the time derivative of position is the partial derivative with respect to momentum of the Hamiltonian function. And this is now a time dependent Hamiltonian function because it depends on the time dependent control parameter, lambda t. And the time derivative of momentum is minus the partial derivative with respect to position of the same Hamiltonian function. Now, so this is well known, this is undergraduate physics, and I think this should be also known to biologists and chemists and uh, maybe even sociologists and economics, economists in the audience if there are any. If they, now, the, uh, the, the tricky point, of course, the partial derivative um, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the Hamiltonian with respect to the position is the what we otherwise interpret as the partial derivative minus the partial derivative of the potential with respect to position, so it's force. And the time derivative of position is momentum divided by mass. Okay, now the time reversal of, uh, of classical mechanics with an external control parameter is that time goes to a new time t star, which is the final time minus time t. Q goes to Q star, which is the same as Q. P goes to P star, which is minus P. And if you do it that way, H goes to H star, which is the same, but with the changed time argument, okay? And F star goes to F also with the change time argument. And this implies that the equation of motion of the time reverse dynamics has the same form, namely the time derivative of P star with respect to T star is F star. And the time derivative of T of Q star with respect to T star is P star over M. And we call this the time in reversal invariance of classical mechanics. Let us now imagine that we do not have a closed system, but an open system. So the, the most, most well-known, the most studied, the most basic example of an open system is when you add friction and noise to the Hamiltonian dynamics. And this is then known as the Kramers Langevin equation. So it's the same equation. Now it seems like the pointer doesn't work, but you can see. So you have Q star is P over M and P star is not only F, there is also a friction force, gamma P over M, and there is a random force with uh, a um, random force psi dot, and then a prefactor, which depends on temperature. And um, thank you, thank you, okay. So I am. I was just talking about these two points, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if I do the same time change on the, this stochastic differential equation, as I did in the previous slide on classical dynamics, I would say T goes to T star equals minus T, Q goes to Q star equals Q, P goes to P star equals minus P, F goes to F star, but what does the equation go to? The equation goes to D, D, T star, Q star is P star over M, D, D, T star, P star is the force, and then there's a plus there. So there's plus gamma P star over M. And then there's a the random force again. So the reverse dynamics, and, uh, and there is, um, there is a, um, uh, an important paper published uh, in 2008 by the late uh, 
uh, Christoph Gavensky and his then PhD student, Raphael Chetrit. Um, they call this uh, time reversal natural, but in many points of view, it's not very natural because the time reverse dynamics doesn't have friction, it has anti-friction. And this does not arise from a microscopic model of interaction with the bath, yeah? So that is the first indication that there are some trickiness in doing time reversal of um, systems interacting with the environment, which lead to friction and, and noise. You can do it differently. And in the same catalog of time reversals due to uh, um, Gavensky and Chitrit, you can also talk about canonical time reversal. And it's the same prescription, except that we now say that the friction force remains the same in the, in the new co coordinates. You could say that it means that gamma goes to minus gamma, but the main part is that this friction force minus gamma P over M goes to minus gamma P star over M. And if you do it this way, the time reversed equation is now a proper stochastic equation with a positive friction. So a process with, a, with another time reversal, a, uh, a physical model has gone to a physical model, not to an, uh, not an aphysical model, okay? Now, for this thing, there are some interesting consequences. And one of the interesting consequences, now the next slide will be the most mathematical of all my slides. So please bear with me. I'm going to talk about, uh, to give you the context of the slide, I'm going to consider now the stochastic differential equation over a sequence of small time intervals. And I'm going to uh, postulate what is the solution one time interval after another, okay? And then, since this is a random uh, equation, this is a stochastic force, the, uh, the interesting question is the probability distribution that I go from one, or the probability that I go from one position at one time to another position at a time later. And position here means coordinate and momentum. Okay? Now, if I look at the whole path, I would have to add or actually multiply these probabilities from going from one time interval to another one. And uh, here is the, uh, the mathematics of this, uh, of this um, uh, um, path integral, if you like, but uh, in, a, in a completely well-defined subject. So the probability function that I have a history of Q and a history of P from the initial time to the final time, it says that at the next time interval, my coordinate is going to be my previous coordinate plus the small time interval times the velocity that I had. That's what the first time says. And the second one says that at the next time interval, my uh, momentum is going to be my previous momentum plus a random term. And this, is a, this gives a Gaussian distribution. So this all boils down to um, the... Um, the formula here in this previous one. This is a way of expressing this particular term, okay? And when you do this, we can compare this probability, the probability of this full path with the probability of the same path, but in the canonically time reverse process. And that means I compare means I take the ratio of the two of them. And if I take the ratio of the two of them, I have the math in some backup slides, which will also be available in the PowerPoint. I find a very nice relation. So the, the probability of the, in the forward process, the original process of some history compared to the probability in the canonically time reverse process of the history giving in the time reverse coordinates is something which can be easily expressed in, um, uh, in one way in terms of the changes in momentum and force and velocity that it comes by canceling uh, two different terms in a Gaussian, which can also be written in a more interesting way. Namely, we can identify this ratio, the ratio of the forward path probability to the backward path probability, to the exponential of the heat that is given up or taken up to, by the environment during this process, during the forward process, okay? And the translation of this is quite simple. You can translate this 
This is on the uh, what, what we have here, and we can translate this uh, by using the Kramers Langevin equation, which is the forward dynamics. And you can identify this as being the force exerted by this, the, it's the reaction force exerted by the, the particle on the environment, and it contains the friction force and the random force. And here you have velocity. So force times velocity, here's force that should be dt. This is work and work done on an environment that's heat, okay? And this definition is due to a, a Japanese scientist, Ken Sekimoto, who is since long works in Paris. And it was first done 25 years ago, a little bit before the discovery of fluctuation relations. And it's also contained in his very well-known monograph published in 2010. Oh. So it means that if for this model, and this is the, the, the template model for many further developments, entropy production, that means the change of entropy in the environment uh, can be defined in two different ways, which are equivalent in this model. And then for every other model, where fluctuation relations have been discovered, it's in fact so that a similar quality is somewhere hidden. And one of the equalities is as a logarithm of a path probability in the forward process to the backward process. And in the other one, which is then a rather abstract quantity, but which you can use in different ways. But the other one is a rather concrete quantity. It's the work done by the particle and environment. So it's a negative of the work done by the, by the environment on the particle or on the degree of freedom described as if it was a particle. And this is what we call heat. So you can do derive, you can state very simple equalities in terms of these quantities and then interpret them in terms of these quantities. And this is the, this is the gist of fluctuation relations. And, uh, here I have the two most famous ones. Both of them can, with this technology, derived in two lines. So let's start with uh, Yarzinski's equality, which is the first one. Okay, let me try to do a particular average. And here I've cheated a little bit because otherwise they wouldn't fit on one line. So X stands for, stands for here Q and P. So let me integrate over initial position, final position, and uh, Gibbs Boltzmann weight for the final position and the average over this entropy production in environment going from the initial position to the final position. Okay. And this, of course, can be interpreted now in two different ways. That's, a, that's a, the gist of the, of the point. Okay. So um, I can change this one. The average means the average over the forward probability. I can change this to average over the backward probability, and then it's an average over one, where I go in the backward path from x for x final to x initial. And now x initial only appears at the final position here, which means I can integrate it out immediately. So it means that all I have is the sum, or if you like the integral over the final position of this Gibbs Boltzmann weight, which is the partition function at the final time with the final, with the uh, control parameters as they are in the final time. But then I can reinterpret the left-hand side to say, okay, this one here, I can take out the uh, partition function in, at the initial time. I can write the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution at the initial time. And then of course, there will be a difference in energy between the initial time and final time because I have to change this one to E minus beta E initial. So that comes here and I have the same here. And then I use the thermodynamic identity that work is internal energy change. Uh, work is related to internal energy change and entropy production. And then I have this equality here. Okay. So it follows directly. No, it is, a, it is an equality. Did I say inequality? Yeah, but it is an equality. And... Uh, it cannot be wrong because it's a derivation in three lines. Yeah. It's like a sufficiently short computer program cannot be wrong. Here's another one, which is equally interesting, which shows you that this actually, this is mathematics. It doesn't really has to do with, with, uh, with, um, with equilibrium or non-equilibrium. I can do another kind of process where I do not necessarily start in equilibrium and I do not end up in equilibrium. Actually, I don't end up in equilibrium here either, but here I can say, I don't stay, I don't, I don't um, assume that I start in equilibrium. 
Okay, so then I take a whatever the final distribution is and I do the same thing. Okay, and I can do the same thing and I get a one here. Okay, and what does this one, how can I interpret this one? Well, I can say it is the average with respect to the initial conditions given then by the raw initial, whatever it is, and of the forward process of the difference of the logarithm of the probabilities in the final state and the initial state and the same entropy production environment. So this, of course, gives you something. It's called uh, the integrated fluctuation theorem due to uh, Udo Seifert. And it says something of the an exponential average uh, of terms which are related to entropy. And it's easy to do by, by looking here that you can say from this one follows the, uh, the second law that means the uh, in expectation, the, um, the entropy of the system and the environment together increases, okay? So both these uh, derivations are quite, quite short, okay? So the observations, fluctuation relations in, the, in classical dynamics, sorry for the mistake here, emerge as some rules from time reversals. And this is so for classical fluctuation relations. And there's of course, so that's been a long debate. So that time reversals in open systems are not um, uniquely defined. And there are indeed different kinds of fluctuation relations, which you can relate to different kinds of time reversals and the definite discussion of all these different uh, options you will find in the paper of in the, the long paper by, uh, by Chetrit and Gavinsky. So you can say that for non, uh, but the example here is, of course, in the, mathematically, it's an example of a non-degenerate diffusion process. The different fluctuation relations are theorems for stochastic processes. So this part you could call not stochastic thermodynamics, but thermodynamic stochastics. These are thermodynamic properties of the theory of stochastic processes. Okay. So um, let me, I, I will do some history. Who invented all this? Yeah. And so, of course, the uh, first we have to uh, give the credit to Chris Jarzinski, who in two papers in 1997 derived this, his equation. First, uh, first for a very simple case, namely a closed Hamiltonian system, and then for a more complicated case described by a master equation. Uh, and uh, at least in the West, these two papers launch fluctuation relations and to a great extent also stochastic thermodynamics as a major topic in statistical physics. But there are precursors. Uh, well, maybe I should say there is an aside which was much discussed, um, maybe uh, which is important for the practical point, namely um, work uh, in this sense has practical advantages compared to heat. Namely, that the work done in the equilibrium process, you can easily see, it must be uh, the time interval of the um, der derivative with respect to time of the potential, okay? So if you have a control potential, which change, which has an explicit dependence on time, say a, Hamilton, a harmonic control potential with either change of the, uh, of the control point or, or of the spring constant, this is a rather easy thing to, uh, to average empirically and to measure. And that's also been a rather important part in why Jarzinski equality is and remains the most uh, well-known fluctuation relation. But there are precursors. And in fact, much earlier, there were two uh, in, that, in those days, uh, Soviet physicists, Bochkov and Kuzolev, who published in, in 1997, they derived a result uh, equivalent to uh, Yarzinski equality, though only in the case of cyclic processes. So they did not, I, and I think it was just they were not interested in other things. They, their derivation would equally well work for Yarzinski equality in the, in the full sense. And uh, I think, and also they related this to time reversals in open systems. This, uh, this result were, is easy to say were not very well um, uh, noticed in the time. Uh, they have written a nice review in uh, 2013 where they discussed uh, the different uh, fluctuation relations and, uh, of course, in relation to their own work. Actually, I looked for pictures of these two gentlemen, but they're not easy to find on the web. And at, the, at that time, they were both in Gorky State University in Nizhny Novgorod, it's in, in Russia, and later Bochkov moved to Donetsk University, which is in, in Ukraine. Uh, I believe, though, that they're both still alive. 
Then uh, there is another relation, which is the relation due to Crookes, uh, slightly later, working uh, at least discussing with Jarzinski. Uh, uh, in my interpretation, at least, this is another kind of sum rule uh, derived from, uh, uh, from forward and backward processes. And it's easily stated in the following way that the, relay, the probability of observing minus the work in the time reverse process divided by observing for the work in the forward process is an exponential which depends on the work that you're looking at the free energy difference and in uh, in units of kbt okay so this is uh, uh, as we will see later in an example quite convenient when when um when uh, looking for um but using this for experimental data, it avoids some of the problems of sampling that you have in your Zinsky equality. And therefore, this equation is the form which has been uh, most widely used. Okay. Then for stochastics, since my example where these are all easy things uh, is for stochastics, credit should be given to Jorge Kurchan for the discovery of fluctuation relations in stochastic processes. There is a, a little later. Uh, paper which is uh, more readable, still not quite easy. And then there is the long uh, paper of the late uh, Christoph Gavensky and uh, Rafael Chetit. But I think this is the definite treatment of fluctuation relations for, for stochastic processes. I believe it still is. Okay. So, um, Thomas, you have to tell me how I'm doing on time. Um, Nobody is um, telling me to hurry up. So I'll, I'll continue a little bit on the place of fluctuation relations in statistical physics, yeah. So stochastic thermodynamics uh, is and has been an extension of thermodynamics to the mesoscopic uh, domain. It, it concerns systems where fluctuations are important. So it's not systems that are thermodynamic, that are large in themselves. And this means that heat work, efficiency, entropy production, and similar quantities all fluctuate. However, in almost all uh, uh, settings that one has been of interest, the system, it's a system that's not large. The environment with which the system interacts um, is, uh, is a thermodynamic bath, it's a heat bath, it's a thermodynamic system. Here are some examples of such systems. Here's the famous ratchet and pole of Feynman from his lectures. Uh, which was analyzed later by uh, uh, Juan Parondo and Pepe Espanol in a very, very nice paper where the, especially the concept of efficiency of this motor was discussed in a very nice way. Turns out in some sense, one can say that Feynman cheated in his lectures. The story is more interesting and, and I recommend for those who want to get into the field to read this very nice paper of, of uh, Parondo and Espanol. I will talk a little bit more, more about this example in the next slide. And this is an example from my colleague in Finland about uh, uh, an experimental device to, to, uh, to consider similar things on the, in the quantum level. It's from the lab of, of Yuka Pekola in Helsinki. And molecular unzipping, it has been one of the major examples. So uh, here, here is an image of a, a, a DNA. Here's an image of an RNA. Here's an image of a protein. And here's some different, uh, say, high profile um, uh, publications of these cases. So the idea is to attach the ends of the single molecules by biochemical means to a bead. And this bead can be moved by laser tweezers techniques and can, so the equilibrium point of the two ends of the molecules can be shifted. And this you can do slowly, of course, but you can also do it relatively quickly. And that means that you change the equilibrium point, you change the potential at the time scale, which is on the order of, or maybe faster than the natural relaxation time of the molecule. So you do, really do have a non-equilibrium process where you pull the molecule apart. But since you know the, uh, the uh, equilibrium points at each time where you pull the molecule apart, but you can also observe where are also these beads, so you actually know what, where they are, you can, uh, you, can derive, you, can, you can from the experimental data, that means the time course of the actual position of the bead, which you use to pull apart the molecule, and what you the control parameter, which is where you would have liked the 
uh, that be to be and where it would be if you would wait for a long time at that control parameter, you can get the non-equilibrium work in these circumstances. You could do it once, then you can put it back, then you could do it once, and the best experimental teams are more or less able to do this a thousand times before the molecule breaks. So you get the statistic from a thousand times. If you do something equivalent in the solid state domain, which was somehow was uh, I pointed to in the previous slides, you can do a million or a billion times and you can get fantastic statistics, but then that is kind of has not had the same impact on the field as, as these experiments. So you can do this and you can verify, for instance, here's a verification experimental by, um, this is um, Felix Retort, uh, who has been one of the pioneers of this of these single molecule techniques. And it's an experimental verification of uh, Crookes relation because uh, you would have um, the logarithm of the ratio of the forward and the backward probability with different work should be the work minus the free energy difference divided by KBT. So you take the logarithm on the left-hand side, you have a linear function on the right-hand side, and so you get a linear slope. And indeed, here's the logarithm of the ratio, and here you have uh, a, uh, a linear function. And you can see that this is a quite good linear fit, okay? So this is a, um, maybe I should say something. Uh, before going here to quantum, let's say, practically, when has this been useful, okay? For which uh, molecules or for which properties of molecules can you get uh, results in this way that you cannot easily get out of the way? It turns out that this is mainly for the free energy, the change of the free energy change. So if you make a change to the molecule and you compare two different molecules, which have slightly different uh, molecular composition, you made a change in one point, then you can make this delta delta F, you can estimate in this way more precisely than any other way. And there's a related techniques to look also at knots and, and the properties and knots as, as um, traps to the folding of molecules, which, uh, which I believe are also at this time uh, leading. Okay. Uh, I don't... I don't think so. Well, I, I don't know. There's no R value in here. Actually, you know, I got this slide from Felix Retort and surely he published the data with an R value, but uh, here there's uh, there's no R value. You can guess yourself, you know, I mean, we are practitioners of the art of estimating slopes, aren't we? Yes. Yes. So what would you say? Is 0 0.0, it's 0 0.04 here um, is significant or not? Probably not, right? But but on the but actually more or less on the uh, on the in the limit, no? Okay. There is actually a lot of technical details uh, going into this, which you can read in the in the papers. There is the issue of that's not only the molecule that you pull apart. There is also the connection between the molecule and the and the handles, and the handles can sometimes also have a free energy. So all these things can play a part. Yeah. Okay. So with this, I go to the last part. If it's um, quantum fluctuation relations and time reversals for general open quantum systems. So now I change uh, gears a little bit. I think I presented to you the case that fluctuation relations is an important part of modern statistical physics, both theoretically and with practical applications. And I'll tell you now a little bit more about my own work, uh, or a bit on the on more on the theoretical side. But. I heard this was perhaps of interest, yeah, also gives a more uh, up-to-date uh, touch of the whole thing, okay? I have 10 minutes. I think I can do this on 10 minutes because, um, yeah, okay, either you understand all of it and then that's the case for you, or you don't understand so much, but then you can relax and look at the slides. So, okay, Angelo, for you, this is a, a rehearsal of quantum evolution, a crash course for the non-quantum people. That's some, somebody like you, right? So uh, then we know that the qubit is a two-state system. Okay, you remember? Yeah, and then a physical state is a complex ray, unit ray in, uh, yeah, okay. You're familiar, right? A, a pure state of n qubits of complex ray in Hilbert space of dimension 2n, it has then two to the 2n minus two parameters, okay? Okay, yeah. And a mixed state of n qubits is a density matrix. This is a completely positive operator of trace one, Hermitian completely. It has two to the two n minus one real parameters. This is another way of saying d squared minus one. Okay. 
And if you have a unitary evolution of cube of n qubits uh, symbolized by matrix U, it of course has the same number of parameters as the as the Hermitian. So that's also two to the two n times one. Okay. Now, if I have a general evolution on n qubits, that's given by in this case two to the four n minus two to the two n. So that is d four minus d two. Okay, so usually if you're not a quantum person, which uh, was my case, until you sort of know anyway, everything up to here, but then you say, oh, this I don't know. Okay, so there is some point where the, the quantumness starts to come in. Okay, so the general um, evolution on n qubits, which is then a, a completely positive trace preserving map, uh, usually denoted by big phi, has many, many more possibilities than unitary evolution. There's much more, and this would be including, say, in the classical limit, a friction noise of many different types of friction and probably many kinds of no, uh, no, uh, of changes which cannot really be described as, uh, as friction at all. So fluctuation relations in quantum systems hold in, isolated, hold in isolated quantum systems, and you can prove this in two lines without using time reversals. This is in closed systems, okay? So I start with an equilibrium state. This is a diagonal state in the basis of the Hamiltonian. And here's the Gibbs, uh, here's the Boltzmann weight. Okay. And I go to the end. Uh, well, uh, uh, and I go to a final state, which is a, a final density matrix, which is a unitary uh, quantum map acting on the initial state in the diagonal state. So this is, um, I mean, I have, I pick one of those, one of the initial states. And this is the final state. And, the, and when I measure it, I get the final state. So on an isolated quantum system, the work should be the difference in the energy. This is called also the two measurement protocol, the difference in energy in the final position minus the initial position. And there is a, a unitary time development implies that the, uh, the map of the unit operator is the unit operator. Uh, in, in other words, the unitary maps are unital, okay? So here you can do one, you can say this average, okay? I write this average in the quantum way, sum of the initial state, initial energy, here's, the, uh, here's this one. And I have the sum of the final state and the matrix elements of the time evolved initial state. And then there's this matrix element on both sides. And here I have uh, the work, okay? So, but when I do this, I have that this operator, um, uh, it, I take the sum over, uh, over, I take this EI here and I cancel this one, okay? This means that EF still remains, but there's no dependence left on the initial state except inside. But then I sum over all these states and the sum of the old states inside is the unit matrix, the unit operator. And so then the, uh, the map of the unit operator here is unity. And so then I have the matrix element of unity. Okay, and then uh, that's uh, F, F, that's uh, just one. And then so all that remains is the sum of the final states of E to the beta E final. And that's the definition of the partition function in the final state. So. This average is the ratio of the partition function in the final state to initial state, which is the e to the minus beta, the change in free energy. And this is another. In fact, this is Jarzinski's original derivation in the classical domain, just stated in the quantum domain. It's the same. Okay. And that is uh, contained actually in a more convoluted way, but it's contained in this paper. And. Uh, so you can imagine then that open quantum time reversal uh, should be uh, discussed on the level of, of um, maps, super maps of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of, um, of CPT maps or on quantum channels. So you will, let's assume that there is a time reversal that maps a forward quantum time uh, dynamics to a backward time dynamics, okay? So let's call this operator, this supermap R, or super operator R. It should be a, an involution. That means it should map every quantum channel into another quantum channel. And if I do it twice, I should come back to the original one. That's a requirement. 
And for unitary time development, it should agree with standard quantum mechanical time inversion defined on, on closed systems. Okay, so if I do this, I can, I can play exactly the same game uh, uh, as I did with the classical case. If I define an entropy production functional from the initial state to the fi final state as the logarithm of these two sandwich, the ratio of these two uh, matrix elements. And then there is, this is in fact in the quantum domain, it's the same derivation of Jarzinski as I had before in the quantum domain, in the classical domain. Okay, it uh, works exactly the same. But is this log ratio of matrix elements and entropy production? And if it is, in which sense? So, of course, there, is, there are specific examples of fluctuation relations in open quantum systems, which are known more than a decade. But the general theory of quantum fluctuation relations has not been found. And there is actually no, no reasonable way in general to attribute this to an entropy production in some environment, even though there are reviews by eminent scientists who claim that there is such a theory. And for instance, this one, uh, which is now a bit old, of course, but uh, yeah, sorry. No, okay, so why is this? Yeah. Uh, and uh, why is this? So here's at least an attempt, a recent attempt to understand why this should be. In quantum, uh, uh, we can put the additional requirement that the time reversal operation of the open quantum systems dynamics has to be a linear supermax. And uh, for those of you doing quantum foundations, which I realized is, for instance, you, you know very well that there is a large literature represented, for instance, by the group of Bruckner in Vienna, investigating supermaps and if i go to the more uh, um, properties of supermaps the more brave uh, italian school there is a, an infinite chain of supermaps and super supermaps and super super supermaps and so on maybe that is why kirvella had to go to hong kong to get the job yeah no this is a joke it's a bad joke sorry i hope this is, this goes live I'm, i apologize to everybody watching this both live and in real life okay so if we take this we can say it's a mathematical problem we have a very large space and can we uh, can we have a involution that is acts linearly and which may when it's acting on unitary time evolution corresponds to standard quantum mechanical time reversal. This is a well-posed mathematical problem, and we can refer to the experts in quantum foundation saying that it's a necessity, that you um, that it has to be, the supermap has to be uh, linear, that otherwise there are problems. We can uh, we can accept their, their point of view in this way. Can, is it possible? It's a mathematical problem. And, and there are two theorems now, I guess I'm in the last two minutes. So let's say there is a main theorem which we managed to prove in this paper on the level of quantum operations. So this is not time preser uh, trace preserving, these are trace non-increasing maps. So it's a slightly bigger space of evolutions, which is easier to work with. And this main theorem has as a consequence that there is no such uh, time reversal. Okay. And I hope this maybe can be a starting point of discussions so for with the of interest with the uh, quantum information and quantum foundations group here and in Derby. Uh, so I come to the summary and outlook. Fluctuation relations are identities in classical open systems that hold arbitrarily far from equilibrium. I did not cover this aspect, but very famous near equilibrium identities like fluctuation response and Onsager relations can, if you frame it in, uh, in a favorable way, uh, see, be seen as consequences of fluctuation relations. Of course, it's a system which can be arbitrary far from equilibrium. The environment remains uh, close to equilibrium. And uh, fluctuation relations, especially Crookes theorem is a data analysis tool. And the most important application so far has been determining folding free energies, or in fact, delta of folding free energies of biopolymers from single molecule pulling experiments. So that's getting a no an equilibrium uh, number from non-equilibrium measurements. In classical open systems, the fluctuation relations follow from time reversal. In quantum open systems, there is no general theory for fluctuation relations. And maybe that's the end of this talk. Maybe that's so, because there is no general quantum time reversal acting as a linear involution. 
Okay, there is a there is a caveat that the theorem we have not been able to show it for quantum channels so far, only for quantum operations. But presumably it will hold also for channels, which is a more complicated space. And with this, I thank you, and I thank the people I worked with uh, on aspects of fluctuation relations over the year, and more recently, uh, Julio Kiribella, Karol Juchkowski, and also Jakub Zakrzewski on the quantum side. And uh, of course, we have to thank the uh, Nobel Symposia for bringing all of us to South Africa and also for being the reason we are here today. Thank you. So there is time for questions. Yeah, I think that there is there's a there's a button to push, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Probably a little bit stupid question. Did people try to use replicas in this kind of? Uh, you mean in the, in the, the spring glasses uh, sense? Yes. N not as far as I know. Maybe Angelo is different. I don't think it's been not used for the as average, as right? No, I don't I, think I so. No. There is no. There's no. There's no. There is an integration right. over the realization of the stochastic process. Exactly. Which is a source of disorder, but not in the same way. It's not. It's, it's not quench disorder. But quench. Yeah. Yeah. So I I see a lot of this discussion is to do with a thermodynamic process in the in the uh, thermal equilibrium or quasi equilibrium system. I wonder. Uh, did, did someone looking at this uh, relation in the gravitational system on uh, as the uh, in gravitational system, yeah. like black holes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are some uh, a Japanese group. There were some papers I read a few years ago that tried to use this in the context of Hawking entropy. It can probably be if you Google uh, Jarzinski equality black holes or something like that. There comes up. There was some three, four papers. I don't think they really achieved anything for black holes, but of course they managed to translate one concept to another one. Mm -hmm. There is the issue, of course, what is the environment for the black hole? Where is the, where, what, is the, what is the heat path? Yeah, if the heat path is the vacuum, that is a very complicated influence on the, on, on the dynamics, which is not Markovian, for instance. So, I mean, there are technical issues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question online from Muzi. Mm -hmm. So he says, so looking at the concept of time reversal, especially when I see it in relation to molecular unzipping, does this mean we are on our way to finding even more accurate ways to trace the evolution of species using DNA? Ah, it's a difficult question. There has been an effort in the literature to do this. Uh, the, the person mainly one usually refers to is Jeremy England, who was a student of Jerzynski. Um, I would say these are attempts to relate this, but I wouldn't say that they actually solve anything, but uh, they certainly uh, achieved quite some, quite some, um, there was a, quite some attention given to them, maybe something like a bit more than five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Does it mean that then. somebody else maybe can get results which, uh, for instance, I would consider more um, practically useful, but yeah, certainly was a great hope for one, yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We still have five minutes for questions. So, you are in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question myself. Yes. Uh, so, if I understood this correctly, then um, uh, you are basically saying that uh, if you uh, look at operations in quantum mechanics, which means uh, that you are uh, kind of, you could uh, think of measurements, for example, um, and you could think of in, uh, interaction with the environment uh, that you then cannot find uh, a map that describes the time reversal in with the mathematical properties that, uh, that you think it would need. And uh, why, I mean, I, I wouldn't be so surprised because I think that if you have such a measurement, or uh, interaction with the environment, you are losing information and therefore uh, you cannot go, uh, get back. Or is this a uh, too naive uh, way of thinking about this? Well, naive is not, um, um, I don't think that's the issue, uh, but I think that the problem is um, 
Mm, the statement of the, uh, the, the the statement of the problem was a little bit different than you say. So I can say, uh, let's suppose I have a time reversal that uh, it, let's suppose I have a a map that compl that depolarizes completely. Okay, so that of course loses. The map loses all the information that I have in the initial state, okay? Then the question is, what is a time reversal of this one, okay? Of course, it cannot be to take the information which is now destroyed, which is now disappeared and go backward and find it again. This is not a time reversal of the, of the completely depolarizing channel. But you can say another depolarizing channel is also a, a, a completely valid, image of the operation of time reversal. And that maps quite well with the stochastic process example in the beginning. I start with the stochastic process with friction and noise, and I do a time reversal classically in that case, and I end, end up with another stochastic process with, with uh, friction and noise, okay? So I could say, okay, I have lost all the information of all particular states, but the channel, the depolarizing channel can have a time reversal, which is for instance, another depolarizing channel. Yeah. So the statement is that there is no, uh, uh, but then what properties do I have to have of this map of channels to channels for this to be a valid time reversal of open quantum systems? So the first one is, I, it has to be, um, it has to be uh, an involution, which means it can, should be uh, defined for every channel. And if I do it twice, I should get back the initial one. And in the trivial example, which I just gave you, that works because I start with the depolarizing channel. I map it to the depolarizing channel. I do it again. I am at the depolarizing channel again. Okay, so that is fine. Uh, then it should be, I, it, if I now specify this map, on should, which should be defined on all channels to unitary channels to uh, to closed quantum systems. It should work in the same way as time reversal that you read on in in more or less elementary quantum mechanics. That means I I change the role of U and U dagger. Instead of having rho going to U, rho U dagger, I should have rho going to U dagger rho U. Okay. Now you can imagine that this is possible to take together the depolarizing channel. In fact, it is possible to take this map of depolarizing channels to depolarizing channels because that is a unital map. And there's a special statement saying that the, sta the space of unital maps, there is such a, uh, a map, okay? A linear transformation that takes every channel to every other channel. If I specify to unital channels, uh, it works. But if I go beyond unital channels, uh, actually we are not quite sure because we haven't proven that there is no such map on channels and channels, from channels to channels, but there is no such map from quantum operation to quantum operations. And that is the statement, which is which acts linearly, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, so can you maybe go back to slide six? I don't see the slides myself oh, anymore. So but... that's factor gamma in the loss of terms. Well, uh, uh, maybe, maybe I should uh, try to go. Uh, somebody should. Um, um, I don't see the slides myself. I don't think actually I am in charge of the slides. Huh? So if I. If, Okay, you can ask the question and I remember the slides, but maybe the audience don't answer, remember the answer. But okay, what is the so question? So on slide six, you had a, a energy loss term. Yes. Uh, there's two terms. Yes. So why is gamma part of both of those equations, those terms? Uh, that's called the Einstein relation. They have to be. Okay. And that is the a part of the relationship between friction forces and random forces that you have and with interacting with a, uh, with a heat bath. Okay, okay. It's also called the detailed balance uh, condition. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, then I would like you to thank the speaker again. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And it's now